Welcome to the Fellowship San Antonio podcast. Our hope is that this podcast will help you to develop a life-changing relationship with God. Um, it's good to see our kids accomplish things. It's good to see our seniors moving on, graduating, um, going to, to school. It's good to see Cullen coming back, making these adult decisions, making a difference in the world, being sent out as a missionary um, from our church. I mean, that, these are huge things. Um, these are things that um, uh, we can celebrate with them, uh, with our kids, with the people that we love. We're emotionally invested in the things that they do. When they do bad, we are saddened, we're grieved. When they're in trouble, we're grieved. When uh, things happen to them uh, that hurt them, we are hurt. And we, we're emotionally invested because of the amount of love that we have for them. And I wonder if we uh, don't always attribute that to God. We always forget that God is an emotional being. He, uh, not emotional, like over-emotional, but his emotions are involved in us. He loves us with a steadfast love, the Bible says. And that means that he's invested in the things that happen to us. When bad things happen to us, when good things happen to us, when we make poor decisions, when we make good decisions, when we um, do the right things and when we do the wrong things, God is not just there um, kind of checking off a list. He's not an automatronic God, right, that's just like, oh, good thing, that means good things will come to them. Oh, I see a bad thing, bad things will come to them. Send out the blessings, send out the curses. That's not how he works. He doesn't just have a lightning bolt in his pocket for us. Um, he's emotionally invested in what we do. And just like um, these parents who have uh, raised up these great kids, these awesome kids, and have uh, sent them out into the world, they, uh, God is the same way. He has not just used one uh, means to reach his people. He doesn't just discipline his people when they do wrong. He loves them in a way that makes sense to them. And that's kind of what we're going to look at today, how God wrestles with us, how God strives with us, with his people, and uh, how he does that. So, we're going to go back in time. We're going to start at the beginning, why not, you know? With Adam and Eve, I want you to imagine this. I want you to think about God not just as the all-powerful being, he certainly is that, but also as a, a person who is emotionally invested in his creation. Okay, Think about God in that way as we begin to kind of talk about this. God is emotionally invested in his creation. Now imagine this. He wants to create a people that he can love and be with forever. That's his plan. We don't know all the thoughts of God, but at least as represented in the Bible, we see that's what God's major plan is. The redemptive history, Old Testament, New Testament, he's trying to create a people for himself to be with and love forever. That's his main deal. That's what he's going after. He goes to great lengths to do that. Maybe not in his, maybe it doesn't hurt him, it doesn't um, make him weak to do all this stuff, but it's a great effort that he puts forth. He decides to make man. But before he gets there, to make someone that he can love and be with forever, he makes a place for them to be. So he creates out of nothing something. And matter and light and time come into existence all at once by the power of his word. And then he creates a universe with the perfect circumstances, physically and biologically, to house this man who he's going to love and be with forever. He makes a fireball and covers it with water and sets it um, in, up in the universe for man to inhabit. He makes a garden, a garden of delights that's perfect, filled full of vegetation and, and people, I mean and people and, and animals. And then he puts Adam and Eve in there as the crown of his creation. And his assessment of his creation is this. It's all very good. That's what we read. But let's not forget He's a, man, he's a God who is emotionally invested in his creation. This is the crown of his creation. Finally have accomplished after six days the, the, a people who I can love and be with forever. And this, it's very good, it's all very good, is a little bit more emotional than just the black and white that we see on uh, in chapter 2 of Genesis. It's kind of like when, um, it's like when uh, Matthew Gilroy was born. 
And uh, we, Vanessa and I have been a part of a small group when, where we've seen uh, several folks have their first babies. And you should see the parents when they, when, they, when they say, oh, wow, look what we've done. Look what we've done. Look what we've created. We've planned and hoped and dreamed and, and purchased <laughs> a lot of stuff and painted the room and we've sewn pillows, apparently. And we've done all these things. And now Gilly is here, the redheaded boy. He's here. He's here for us to love. We've done it. Look, and he celebrates. That's what's happening here in Genesis 1. We've done it. We've created God. We've created God. We've created man to love and to be with forever. I'm tired. There's a lot going on. Give me a break. Uh, don't laugh. It throws me up. Okay, so he, this is what he's doing. So he's emotionally invested, okay? He's emotionally invested, all right? He creates a man, and it's all very good. Don't laugh. Adam and Eve, he creates them. And then what do they do? Chapter 3, what do they do? They sin against him. He says, here's this perfect place. I want you to just, uh, you know, keep up the garden, you know, plant some fruits and veggies, you know, do that whole thing. Um, Be fruitful, multiply, create a people that I can love and be with forever. Do that. Show that you love me by just avoiding this one thing, this one fruit here in the center of the garden. Just stay away from that. And they don't do that. Adam and Eve fall, and they say, you know what, God, we don't trust you. That's, we, we want this thing that you don't want us to have. We don't quite love you that much. We want to do our own thing. And this is God's response to, uh, he, this is what he says to the woman in Genesis 3. He says, what is this that you have done? And when we read that, we're reading the Genesis account, all this stuff that happens in a really short amount of time, in a really short amount of words in the Bible. And we kind of skip through that. We say, what is this you have done? And then the woman replies, the, the serpent that you sent here, that you created, he's the one who deceived me. And then God says to the serpent, you're really bad and you'll crawl on the ground. And we miss the emotion here, the emotional investment. Okay, um, He's created all of this and created all of this perfect um, place this garden of delights, and put man there to love him, be with him forever. And then they rebel against him. All of this energy, all of this um, output of love, and all of this planning, and all of this stuff, and then his creation rebels against him, says, I reject you as my God, as my Father. We're going another way. We don't trust the things that you've given us. We want something else. And God reacts What is this that you have done? What have you done? Do you know what this is going to cause? Do you know what this requires me to do? Death has to come into the world because you can't remain a sinful person forever. I've got to bring death into your life. You've got to die at some point so that you can be raised and redeemed. The whole plan has to be adjusted. Now, this is one of the interesting things. God knows the end from the beginning. He's eternal. He exists outside all of God's plans, everyone that God uh, will save, God's redeeming work, all of that stuff, God knows from the beginning before he ever creates anything. Okay, exists out of time. But the Bible shows us over and over again, this is really weird, the Bible shows us over and over again that in this time span of life on earth, God reacts emotionally to the things that are happening to the things people are doing, to the choices people are making, to what you guys are doing, and, and, and to the celebration that we have when Mandy gets up here and graduates. I'm not the only one who's proud. God's very proud, and God is celebrating. So this is this weird thing. God exists outside of time, and he sets it all, sets the course, and he, and he knows who's going to do evil and who's going to do good, and he uses the wickedness of man to further his own good things. It was wicked people who killed Jesus, but that was a part of the plan. God, God knows all these things, but somehow, mysteriously, and it's been driving me crazy the last few weeks, I can't figure it out, God reacts emotionally to the things that are happening. And that's exactly what we see here. God says, what is this that you've done? What have you done? Eve, what have you done? Do you understand the gravity of this situation? You've got to leave the garden. You've got to leave my presence. Sin will come into the, uh, into the world. What's going to happen next with the story of Cain and Abel? Cain, sin doesn't just leave, stop at, at Adam and Eve. His, their children, Cain and Abel, have sin. And Cain is a wicked man, we read in the Bible. And he is jealous of Abel and his goodness. And so he kills his brother. Now imagine this. You're God. I know, just, you're God, okay? 
and you are emotionally invested in your creation, you love the people that you've created, you have a purpose, a hope, a plan, a dream for them, and the second generation okay, of people, they're killing each other. They're killing each other. Things have gone so awry that they're killing each other. As we continue on the story, things get really bad. But here's a little uh, glimpse of hope that we see Enoch in uh, Genesis 5. Enoch's a guy who walks with God. And he walks with God, and so God just kind of assumes him into heaven. Jesus, uh, Enoch's walking with God, and, and, and he never tastes death because um, God sees what a great job he's doing, how much he loves God. And so he just takes him up into heaven. We read in Genesis 5.24, Enoch walked with God and was not found, for God took him. Isn't that interesting? It's so weird. But you know what? If I were God, I think I'd do the same thing. Things are getting worse and worse on the earth, this earth that you've created. People are doing worse and worse sins, and then you see uh, somebody doing a good job. I would pluck that guy, and this guy's coming with me. He's getting out of that corrupted world among those corrupted people. He's coming with me to be with me forever. He walks with me. I'm going to reward him among his uh, generation. Then we get to Noah and his generation. Genesis 6 through 9, we read the story of the flood narrative. And things are really bad. The Bible says that God looks down on his on people, on his creation, and he sees that nothing, that all of their thoughts are nothing but evil continually. They're, all of their thoughts are nothing but evil continually. That's bad. That's gone from bad to worse. And God makes it, look, look at what he says. And the Lord regretted that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him in his heart. He's reacting emotionally with grief and with regret. And, and this doesn't mean that God blew it or God messed up or this wasn't a part of the plan. Remember, God exists outside of, of the earth, outside of time. Okay, And so he sees the end from the beginning. He speaks about future things as though they were past. God sees it all. Okay, And all of these things are part of his plan. He's planned for them all. Don't, nothing surprises God. But mysteriously, God is reacting with emotion, regretting grieving over the sin of people. This is tough. And then God says this. I want you to see this. He says this, My spirit shall not abide in man forever, for he is flesh. His days shall be 120 years, and then the flood comes. And he appoints Noah as this preacher of righteousness, a preacher of repentance, to say, Hey, people, you're going the wrong way. Come back to God. I'm building an ark. God's bringing judgment on the earth. Things are really bad. We're thinking of evil, new evil things to do all the time. Stop doing that. Come with me. Be on the earth, on the, on the ark, and be safe. Look at the words he uses. I will not abide in man forever, for he is flesh. He's weak. Man is going after all kinds of evil. I've assessed, first of all, my creation is good, and sin comes into the world, and now, just a few chapters later, very regrettably, man is weak. I'm regretting this stuff. I'm grieving this situation. He says, I shall not abide with man forever. Punishment is coming. The word abide in can also be a, a translated strive with. Some of your translations probably say that. It can also be translated contend with. God describes his relationship with, earth, with his creation as a striving, as a struggling, as a contention. The word can mean quarreling, wrestling. God's presence in our life is active. God's presence in, in his, the things that he does in our life, he's very active. When it says he abides with us, okay, that's very true. God lives with us. He abides among us. For New Testament Christians, we, we, we uh, have the Holy Spirit in us. He abides in us. But the Holy Spirit is not in me and he's not in you just kind of kicking it on the pool, you know, uh, on a floaty with some lemonade, just kind of relaxing. He's inside of you, striving with you, contending with you, striving with you for your own good, often against your own will. God is fighting with you. Really interesting. If you look at the Old Testament, the history of Israel, it's this over and over and over again. 
It's God fighting with his people. And sometimes he's fighting with his people um, with blessing, and sometimes he's fighting with his people with teaching, and sometimes he's fighting with his people with the establishment of law, and sometimes he's fighting with his people by leading them and providing leaders with them, and sometimes he's fighting with his people by providing discipline, by killing off several of them, by coming down hard on them. God doesn't just use discipline all the time and wrath. Sometimes he uses blessing to strive with us. When God says he strives with us, this is what he means, that he struggles with us, often against our will, but always for our good. You could write a Psalm 78. Psalm 78 describes the history of Israel in this way. And you could write that. I could write that. How God has striven, what's it, strove? How God has quarreled with me against, my, I'm making up words, against my will often, but for my own good. He's fought with me. And then we see this really cool illustration in uh, Jacob's life. The first part of Jacob's life is nothing but deceit and deception. Jacob is a trickster, and he tricks his brother Esau out of the birthright and a blessing that uh, were, in human standards anyway, belonged to his older brother. But Jacob ripped him off, basically, by trickery. And uh, he, comes, he has to come back to see his brother Esau, come back to the promised land after he gets his wives, and come back there. And he knows he's going to see Esau, and Esau has promised to kill Jacob. And he's sad, and he's upset, and he's scared. And for the first time in Jacob's life, Jacob prays desperately to God. He comes to God and says, God, you're the God of promises. You're the God who um, has made promises to my uh, ancestors, to Abraham and to my father Isaac. And I call upon those covenant promises that you be with me. A funny thing happens after that. Jacob is no longer a man who tricks. He's no longer a trickster. And I encourage you to read that story. I wish we had time to do so. But something crazy happens in his life. He begins to cling to God after that. What Jacob does first is he wants to be the God of his life. He wants to be the God of his own life. He wants to do his own thing. He wants to get what he wants in his way, in his strength, with his own wisdom. And then he comes to this point of desperation when Esau is mighty and he has to meet Esau and he's afraid and finally he calls out to God and he does. And the rest of his life he spends calling out to God in that way, clinging to God's promises instead of doing things his own way. The uh, Let's read the passage in Genesis 32 so we see where we're at with Jacob wrestling with God. Genesis 32. And verse 22, let's just read from verse 22. Jacob's very afraid that he's going to meet Esau. And Esau is very strong, 400 men and um, a big family, many servants. And Jacob is worried about this. And so he divides his family into two camps. That way, just in case one of them is destroyed by Esau's sword, the other one will survive. And um, he sends some presents along ahead of himself to, to reach Esau. In verse 22, we see this. The same night, Esau, or, or I'm sorry, Jacob arose and took his two wives, his two female servants, and his eleven children, and crossed the ford of the Jabbok. He took them and sent them across the stream, and everything else he, that he had. And Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him until the breaking of the day. When the man saw that he did not prevail against Jacob, he touched his hip socket, and Jacob's hip was put out of joint as he wrestled with him. Then he said, let me go, for the day has broken. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. And he said to him, what is your name? And he said, Jacob. Then he said, your name shall no longer be Jacob, but Israel, for you have striven with God and with men and have prevailed. Then Jacob asked him, please tell me your name. But he said, why is it that you ask my name? And there he blessed him. So Jacob called the name of the place Peniel, saying, for I have seen God face to face, and yet... My life has been delivered. God is willing to wrestle with us. When we're, we want to do things our way and in our strength, God is willing to wrestle with us. And I want you to see this. 
God is wrestling with Jacob in his mercy. At any point, can't God take Jacob down? Absolutely. But God comes to Jacob as an angel, and he wrestles with him, and, and there's a push and a pull. Just like in the life of Israel, the nation of Israel, and just like in your life and in my life, there's a push and a pull, a chess match that God is playing with you to win your soul, to do good things for you. And sometimes you make a move that's rebellious, and sometimes you make a move that's good. And sometimes God makes a move that's disciplined, and sometimes he makes a move that's blessing. And, some, and this whole thing is going on. And then at one point, God doesn't just grab us and, and, and at once grab us by the neck and make us do what he, what he wants us to do. But at one point in Esau's life and in this little wrestling match that we just read, God does. He touches the hip of Jacob, and he's disabled. And he can't do anything. And he's desperate. And so Jacob's response is to cling to God. Don't come to the point in your wrestling with God, that God has to disable you. That God has to show you the consequences of your own actions to the point that you're hurt in a major way, that your family's hurt in a major way, that someone has to lose their life or lose a job or lose something that's important to them. Don't come to that point. Cling to God now. Be on God's side. It doesn't make sense to wrestle with God if God's wrestling for your good. That makes no sense. And so I'd like to ask you a couple of questions. What area of your life are you wrestling with God? Where is God trying to prevail for your own good, but against your will? How can you change your wrestling with God to clinging to God's promises? Hosea describes this situation in Genesis 32, and he describes it in this way. He says that clinging to God is how you prevail with God and among men. He describes Jacob's clinging to God as weeping and seeking God's favor. He describes it as returning to God, repenting, and holding fast to love and to justice, and waiting continually for your God. Which one of those do you need to do today? Do you need to repent? Do you need to have a little weeping session with God, cry out to him? Or do you just need to hold fast to good things? Or do you need to wait on him? How do you need to cling to God today? You know, we have a lot of folks who are struggling physically, but um, they're not the only ones. The people that we prayed for earlier, they're not the only ones struggling a great deal. Um, Vanessa and I are struggling a great deal. I know a lot of you guys are. And um, we can um, leverage our struggling. We can leverage the effort that we put forth in our struggling, either for our good and with God or against God and for our detriment. Decide to cling to God today. That's all the time we have. And so we'll pray and then we'll take our offering today. Father in heaven, we love you and um, we need you. There's places in my life that I know I've been fighting you. Um, Father, I pray that uh, things don't that I don't fight you so much that you have to hurt me in a way that just disables me, that just rocks my life completely. I pray that instead I wise up and I cling to you. I pray that for these people here today. I pray that we love you, that we talk to you emotionally, that we repent and come back to you, that we seek your favor your way. Father, thank you for being emotionally invested in my life and in our lives. Thank you for choosing to strive with me. I know my failures and my weaknesses um, would be off-putting and would try your patience. And I just thank you that you're merciful to me, that you continue to work in my life. Thank you for working in the lives of these folks. We've given you enough reason to walk away from us. Thank you for striving with us. Thank you for contending with us. Thank you for putting us in a headlock when we need it. Thank you for doing what is required in order to bring us to you. Help us to wise up today. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.